an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame Well hi there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity brought to you by Bible Talk. We're going to be doing a uh, special study today, maybe two parts, I'm not quite sure yet. I'm what is probably the single most important topic in all of Christianity, and that is the word of the cross. So we're going to start that in just one second, right after I ask the Lord, Father, we, we just want to be a blessing, and we want to be blessed by you. We trust and look to your Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth. So, Lord, I just pray that you would control what's said here, that you would bless what's said here, and, Lord, that it would be an encouragement to all of us, those who are sitting here and those out there. I ask you to bless them, Father, in Jesus' precious name. All righty. As I said, we're going to start. We're going to look at the word of the cross, which is, that's the core of Christianity. Without the word of the cross, there is no Christianity. There's no such thing. It's, it's all, it all, everything prior, I mean, from the fall of Adam, when, when God kicked them out of the garden, from that time up until the crucifixion, everything was leading up and prophesying and leading, pointing towards it. After that, everything in the in scriptures points back to it because it is central to all teaching in, in the word, right? Think about the fact what Paul said. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, said, he said, I have determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's 1 Corinthians 2, 2. I mean, that's how central it was to the teaching of Paul. And you know how central the teaching of Paul was to Christianity. You know, in the early church, if you look at Acts chapter 2, it talks about what they did day by day. Every single day, what they did is they gathered, they had fellowship, they had they got listened to the teaching of the apostles, and they had prayer, and they had the breaking of bread. The breaking of bread is the commemoration, the, the recognition of what Jesus Christ, what God the Father did for us in Jesus Christ. His broken body and his shed blood. There is no greater gift. There is no more important gift than that, right? But since they did that day by day, they were focused on the word of the cross all the time. Yes. You know, I, I find it interesting. And, and remember, when it comes to that, the Apostle Paul also said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. First Corinthians 11, 26. So we're, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be proclaiming his death because that is... The only answer. All right. I find it interesting that the church over the centuries has kind of refocused Christianity uh, on two things, which is Christmas and Easter. Yes. <clears throat> Christmas, which is not scriptural at all. And obviously, if you look at the first 90 years of scripture in the New Testament, you'll find no reference to the church celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. And then the resurrection. Well, thank God for his resurrection. But the fact of the matter is, what's important is his resurrection, Jesus being resurrected, is not what saved you. It was his death that saved you. And only his death that saved you. And somehow that's kind of gotten lost in there or become far, far less important. That should be central, all right? For the word of the cross, think about this now. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1.18. It's the power of God. But it's foolishness to those who are perishing. Right? We have a problem in the church. Now, when I talk about the church, you know, the parables of the wheat and the tares. Not not everything every not everything that has a cross on the top or has a pulpit inside is a church. Church is a gathering of believers. 
more two or more believers gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. That's church. It doesn't matter where you gather. It's about gathering in the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, we have had church in some mighty, mighty strange places, and it's been wonderful. Yes, it has. We're not required to find a building to have it in. The early church didn't have a building, right? So, and one of the you said it's a gathering of believers. It is a gathering of believers. But the church today is filled with unbelievers. Well, that's not new, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, that the, the fact that, you know, there are those who come into the church and then preach another Jesus. Yes. They have a different, they have a different spirit and they proclaim a different gospel. That's exactly what Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians. What read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. That's the, the, the case of the wheat and the tares. And there's so much scripture about being on guard, about how Satan will send in people to destroy the church. And, you know, it says in Second uh, Corinthians 11, for such men are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So this shouldn't shock us. And then Jude said, for certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness, and they deny our master and Lord Jesus Christ. They've snuck into what? They've snuck into the church. Snuck? Snuck. <laughs> they sneaked into the church unnoticed. How they got in unnoticed, that in itself represents a problem in the body of Christ, okay? And in Paul writing to the Galatians, think about this. He wrote to the Galatians in the first chapter, chapter 1, verse 7. He said, talking, talking about another gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. This is the tares among the wheat. This is the false prophets and their followers, those who proclaim that they are sons of Abraham, and yet Jesus said that they're sons of their father, the devil. They tickle the ears and teach what people desire to hear, what people want to hear, not what God wants them to hear. Think about it. Jesus warned us to beware of the wolves in sheep's clothing because the way that leads to destruction is wide and easy. Right? But the true bond servants of Jesus Christ proclaim the difficult word. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus said that in Matthew 7 14. That truth, that truth leads us to the horror of the cross. You see, as, as the heart of the cross, my goodness gracious, can you picture Jesus Christ battered, bloody, beaten, mocked on the cross? That certainly looks like a horror. But the horror of the cross reveals the glory and the love of the Father. Amen. You've got to get that. I mean, that's what's the wonder. That's the mystery of the cross. That, that, that horrible picture is exactly the most wonderful thing that we have ever seen. All right. It, but it's kind of like a gangster movie. Right? See the Godfather? The Jews wanted him dead, so they hired the Italians. To, you know, they, they, well, that's another story. Um, but it was God the Father who was actually responsible. What? It says in Isaiah 53, verse 10, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, Jesus. Putting him to grief. Right. God the Father, he's the one that caused him. But who is responsible? I was responsible. You were responsible. It was our sin that required that Jesus, who had no sin, come down and die in our place. He who had no sin became sin for our sake. 
you and I are responsible, right? It's not about the, the Jews or the Italians. It's us. It's mankind. For God so loved the world that he sent his, gave his only begotten son. So whoever would receive him. That's us. God gave him. It says in Isaiah 53, 5, but he, again talking about Jesus, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Well, of course, he had no sin, but it says he who had no sin became sin for our sake. That's why it's, it's, it's such a stumbling block for a lot of people. As a matter of fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. That's important. You've got to understand that the word of the cross, if you're not saved, this is all going to be foolishness to you. Unless the spirit of God moves upon you right now and changes your heart. Because, well, we'll talk, let me just talk about that. Why was he a stumbling block to the Gentiles? We pre pre preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block to Jews foolishness. Why was he a stumbling block to the Jews? Well, think about his last words on the cross, Jesus' last words on the cross. In John 19.30, it says, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What was finished? You know what was finished? Sin was finished. When, when, he was, when he died on that cross, everything that was necessary for our salvation was accomplished, was done. Now, that's a really important statement, and I pray that you understand that, okay? Jesus had said in, in John 17, 4, he said, I have glorified you on earth, talking about the Father, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Jesus accomplished the work. So there's no work for us but, to do. Well, the, the apostles came to Jesus and said, tell us, what is the work that we should do? And he said, the work that you're supposed to do is to believe in me. What are you saying? You can't do anything to achieve, to earn, to work for salvation. His last words, get this now, were, it is finished. That's a flat statement. It's done. It's over. It's finished. Everything that needed to be done for salvation was done then and there. You know, years ago, uh, when I got saved, I owned a small advertising agency in New York. And uh, I was very unsaved when I was unsaved. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I look so happy about it. But when I got saved, I got good and saved. And I, I praise God and thank Alice that she was faithful because she got saved the month before me and diligently prayed for me, prayed over me, and put a Bible under my bed when I was sleeping for that month. And at my dining room table one day, as a matter of fact, it was my birthday, I opened the Bible for the first time in my life, I believe, and God spoke to me, and I got good and saved. Your 33rd birthday. My 33rd birthday. Quite some time ago now. Getting older. <laughs> so, so anyhow, I mean, it was noticeable, as it should be. When you get saved, it should be visible to people. Because when you get saved, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And that new creation should be visible. I began to think differently. I began to talk differently. I began to work differently. I began to do everything differently when I got saved. And everybody around me noticed it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that happened on the day that I got saved, I mean, I was having a conversation with Jesus. You can take that or not, but I had, was having a conversation with Jesus. And near the end of it, he said to me, you've had your life. Now it's mine. It's over. It's done. I got a new life, but it belongs to him. So I was going to close the advertising agency, transfer all of the clients, and go serve the Lord, which is what we decided to do. So my dad lived in Florida at the time, and as I said, we were in New York. So I, call, I used to call and talk to my father every week. And I called him, and I, of course, I was very excited. I called him and I told him about what had happened. 
you know, that I got saved. Now, my dad, he had been raised as a Protestant Christian, and then early on, he wanted to get married to my mother, who was a Roman Catholic. So he had to convert to Catholicism, which was the rule back then, in order to marry her. So he, my dad was a nice guy, but he wasn't saved. And the simple fact of the matter was that he didn't understand salvation, and he wasn't very he, he wasn't very spiritual. He could be at times uh, be religious. Right. Yeah. He used to take me to church every once in a while, uh, but that's 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 not what life is about here. It's about being right with our father, right? So when I told him that I was going to close my agency, give it away, not sell it, give it away, and go and pray and seek the Lord. And serve the Lord. And serve the Lord. <clears throat> he literally, and I, this is not an exaggeration, he literally thought that I had gone nuts. Mm -hmm. So in, in the fullness of time here, very quickly, I was able to, I did, I closed the agency, transferred all of the accounts, my, my father thought I went nuts. Well, I'll tell you what helped was that as I was closing down the agency, I had uh, one Spanish billionaire who was involved in a number of the clients that I did advertising work for. And we had a very good relationship. So when I told him that I was closing it down, he offered me a job. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, no, no I'm going to, I'm going to go. I'm going into ministry. And he said, well, he said, I'll let you come in and work for me like part time, work one, two, three days a week, whatever you want. And he made me an offer for a, a, a very lot of money, a, a very lot of money. Ridiculous. And you know, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a new company car, and I'll give you offices in Manhattan and all the expenses. So I thought, well, okay, well, this is good. That's gotta be God. That's gotta be God. That's what we thought. Yeah. Yes. So I called my dad, and I told him that, and now he felt much better. Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting rid of the business and going to go out and live just based on faith. So I went to bed that night. And as I was laying there and I was praying, I heard the Lord say to me, boy, it didn't take much to get you off track. I, I had said, I'm going to go serve the Lord full time. I mean, I'm going to go. And all of a sudden, pow, that was out the window because somebody was, it was a distraction. So I had to call, I had to call that fellow the next day and tell him, you know, thank you very much, but I'm going to have to, I am you know, decline. <clears throat> So when I called my father back and told him now that I decided not to take the job, that I was going to go, now he knew for sure that I was absolutely nuts. Yeah. He was ready to send the white coats. He was. As a matter of fact, he couldn't send the white coats. So what he did was he flew from Florida up to New York. And by this time, we had, we had moved up to upstate New York. And we're living in a two-family house with another saved couple. And we, we were already involved in prayer meetings and uh, having Bible studies. just constantly so when my father got there he stayed with us and he said to me he called me butch by the way and he, he said butch you know you, you can't do this you're gonna you're gonna burn yourself out you you, know, you can't burn the candle at both ends because we're going i mean they, yeah i said that is not a candle it's a stick of dynamite don't worry about it so we were not i kept sharing the gospel with him and he kept telling me that in a, in a loving way that i was crazy and you asked him that before he left well yeah that's what i'm coming to yeah I, I said to him, Dad, because at, at, at that point, my dad was, I think, 67 years old, much younger than now. And I said, Dad, you know, you're getting of an age. I said, what's going to happen when you die? And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, you can know. And that involves accepting the work of Jesus Christ on that cross. So he went back to Florida. And as it was, every week, I would call him, and I think I used to call him on Wednesday Wednesday evenings, just so we could chat and keep up to date with each other. So I called him one one Wednesday, and like I said, it was in the evening, and I was sharing with him again about what we were doing, and he stopped me and he said, Butch, he said, I want what you have. I want Jesus. Well, what a glorious moment. And I prayed with him over the telephone, right then and right there, for him to receive that great gift of salvation, that free gift of God by grace. So he was saved. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And I said to him, Dad, I love you. And he said to me, praise, praise the Lord. And that was the end of our conversation.
What a wonderful conversation. The next night, we had traveled uh, about 45 minutes away to go to a large prayer meeting. And there were a couple hundred people there, a prayer meeting that we went to regularly every week. And during the middle of the prayer meeting, I somebody signaled to me, and I had gotten a telephone call. Somebody tracked me down, and it was my aunt. And she told me, Butch, I just got news that your father passed away last night. Mm. That was unexpected. Yes, there was nothing wrong, no health issues. No health issues, but he passed away that night. So I went back into the room and I shared with the people, I said, you know, I just got news that my dad died last night. And of course, there's 200 people in the room going, oh, and I said, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. My father got saved in Pal Zoom straight to the throne room. I should, I, you know, I, why him, not me? <laughs> God can do that. Do you really believe? That to live is Christ, to die is gain. I mean, you know, we talk about, oh, I'm looking forward to getting there. What a great day of rejoicing that will be. But then when, if it comes time to go, all of a sudden, what happens to your attitude? So anyhow, but the point is, the point where I'm getting long-winded as it is, is that my father had been saved for, for months. He hadn't changed his lifestyle as far as I know. I mean, he didn't start going to church. He didn't. But he was saved because everything that he needed to have happen in order for him to be qualified to go into the presence of God the Father had been done by Jesus on the cross. Amen. I mean, I've been saved for 44 years now. I'm still, am I working at it? No, I'm not working at it. I'm just trying to be a faithful bondservant of Jesus Christ. But I'm not working to get saved. I'm not working to be right with God. I can't do that. I, you can't do it either. We have a purpose. If he doesn't call us when we accept him, he has a purpose. For in us. our lives. And believe me, if you're saved and you're watching this now, God has a purpose for your life. Because we are all here and every Christian has a ministry. The Spirit of God works through each one individually as he wills. We all have a ministry. Okay. And that is to proclaim the word of the cross. So, but the reason I say all of this is to deal with the fact that it says that the word of the cross is a stumbling block. It's a stumbling block to the religious people. Why? Well, the answer to that is quite simple. And Jesus clarified that in, in the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to read Mark 7, verses 5 through 9. The Pharisees and the scribes, now you can't get much more religious than that. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he, Jesus, said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandments of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was saying to them, you are experts at si setting aside the commandments of God in order to keep your tradition. You see, the problem is, when you get saved, saved by the work of Jesus Christ, the atoning work of Jesus Christ on that cross, it's done. It's finished. Oh, yes. You know, there are things you are could do, should do. That, that you, because you're an ambassador for Christ, you are here as the light of the world. You are here as the salt of the earth. There's, there's work for you to be doing, but it doesn't achieve your salvation. That's a done deal. It was finished. The problem is, like with the scribes and the Pharisees, they had they thought that the people had to come through them to get salvation, right. and the they had to do the works. You know, of, of the religious works in order to have a right relationship with God. And God said, no, I've taken care of that. I've done that, right? There's nothing you have to do to be saved other than to believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior and receive it. Receive him. That's what it says in John 3, 16, right? And you know that. And then think about what it says in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Are you a Bible believing Christian? I mean, do you believe these things? 
because that's exactly what it says. You didn't do anything to earn salvation. You can't do anything to earn salvation. It's a free gift of God. A pastor can't save you. An evangelist can't save you. Belonging to a particular church can't save you. And and by the way, P.S., a little P.S. here. You don't ever belong to a church. That's right. You are the church. You belong to God. You were bought with a price, purchased with a price. All right. So you don't you don't have to, you cannot work to earn it. What did Jesus say? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. You can't do anything to achieve it on your own. So that's why religious leaders don't like the word of the cross a lot of times, especially to hear that it's finished and it's all been done, because it kind of takes it, it takes away their prestige because they didn't have humility, right? I mean, Jesus said, beware of the, the leaven of the Pharisees. What was the leaven of the Pharisees? Hypocrisy. We have to be on guard. Thank God, because God has appointed in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors and teachers to equip you for the work of service. You're to do the work of service, okay? So thank God for them. They don't save you. And that the simple fact of the matter is you don't necessarily need them. You need Jesus Christ. It's the only there's, there's only one intercessor between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, Paul wrote to Timothy. So that's the that's why it's a stumbling block to the to the Jews. Why is it foolishness to the world? Stop and think about this. I mean it's so logical when you think about it. Jesus called his disciples to himself, and he said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28. That's so absolutely incomprehensible to the world that somebody who has all the power, who has all the authority, would humble himself and serve. It's man's nature to want to be lifted up and exalted and be at the top of the pile. Right? Worldly rulers don't bow down. They wear pride as a crown. We have to learn to be humble. Jesus said this, and how much more clear can this be? Now I'm going to read from Paul, right? In Philippians. In Philippians chapter 2, it said, Have this attitude in yourselves which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. I mean, how many world leaders do you see that are humble? And I'm, not, I'm talking about in reality. Because they have power. It was you know, Lord Acton in Britain that said years, I mean, centuries ago maybe, that power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. The world sees humility as weakness. Yeah. So that's why none of the leaders could have humility. That's true. But blessed are the meek. Right. Blessed are the humble. I'll tell you what. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's what you should be joyful about. That's what you should be rejoicing about. That is the word of the cross. It's all been done for you. It's all been accomplished for you. Salvation is the free gift of God. Yes, it is good to have fellowship. I thank God for the, the church. But the church is not a denomination. It's not an organization. 
it is a gathering of believers. Where two or more are gathered in his name, that's church. So he said, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. We've had church. I mean, you know, Alice and I have traveled a good portion of the world. We have had church all over. Some of the best church I ever had is not in church buildings. It's that thing where we had an encounter. Had an encounter with people, shared the gospel, shared the good news of Jesus Christ, and seen the Holy Spirit go to work. All right, I'll tell you what, this is obviously now going to be a two-parter. Because there's another really, really important facet to all of that. And that is the cross as a symbol that determines and develops and keeps our relationship with God and with one another. That's very, very important. And I don't want, I don't want to try and rush that. So we'll do that as the next study, all right? We'll call it the Wood of the Cross, which, by the way, is a beautiful song that we used to sing years ago. Behold the wood. Behold the wood of the cross. So, Father, I just thank you. Well, how, can, how can we begin to say thanks for the things that you've done for us? How, what, I mean, so often we are focused on little things in our life. But you gave your son Jesus. That's what empowered the Apostle Paul. Turned his life upside down. And he actually turned the world upside down. Because in Romans chapter 8, he said, If God loved me so much, if he loved you so much, and gave his son on that cross, what good thing would he withhold? Nothing. God has proven, we know what love is by this, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. The cross is ever, ever, ever so important. We need to have a right understanding of it, and we need to live based on what God has done, not on what we're doing. And that will change what you're doing. So, Father, we just thank you and we praise you. How, how can we say thanks? I don't, I don't even know. But we love you. And by the power of your word, we will grow to love you more and more day by day. And I pray that in Jesus' precious name, Father. Amen and amen. amen. So we'll be back for the second part of this. If you have any questions or comments, write to us at officeatbibletalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until then, may the Lord our God bless you, bless you to bits and make you more like Jesus. For that indeed is his promise now to us believers. Jesus loves you. Oh, so much. God bless you and goodbye. God's love Above the heavens God's love Deeper than the sea Love always watching.